This video is sponsored by Nebula, the thoughtful streaming service created by me and my creator friends. Check out the link in the description or stay tuned to learn more. There's a certain strain of urbanism which I've never aligned with. It's the sort of small is beautiful worldview where any building over five stories is bad and the best part of the city is the park at the edge of the city which is by definition not city. One thing that such people often don't like are elevated trains, including a prominent urbanist who once quite famously said that they destroy neighborhoods. Something I took quite personally coming from Canada's own local elevated train town. I think many of these attitudes are shaped by an imagined version of Chicago, Philadelphia, and New York City, where the elevated trains serve only as a backdrop for scary 20th century crime movies, or as a way of portraying America's best cities as rundown towns. Of course, if you ask the average Chicagoan if they'd rather get rid of the elevated trains, they'd say no. And the same thing is no doubt true for New York. In fact, I'd say that New Yorkers would probably like to get some of their elevated trains back, for example on 2nd Avenue. I mean, it's really hilarious. New York's second or third most popular attraction is literally an old elevated rail line. These things are very popular. But I want to step back from the elevated trains of some of the world's greatest cities and talk about what elevated rail is like today as well as in the past, what its benefits are, and why we need to champion this obviously beneficial technology for more cities. A technology that lets us build affordable, rapid transit quickly and that isn't hidden away from people. Transit that can be one of the best things about a city and which can provide residents an incredible view of their metropolis. Let's talk about it. Hey, I'm Reese, and this is RM Transit, a channel about flying trains and why they're fantastic. As you probably gleaned from the intro to this video, elevated trains were certainly common in the past, and they're common today as well. And while most people, especially in North America, associate the idea of an elevated train with a certain gritty American metropolis like Chicago, the truth is elevated trains can be found all around the world, including in historic cities. From Paris to Hamburg and even places in London where giant embankments elevated trains before the elevated steel structures of other cities. Elevated rail is common in cities around the world, and while I am certain there was lots of nimbyism when Paris put up these steel viaducts that carry some of its metro lines a century ago, I'm also certain that today there would be riots if they were ever slated for removal. Elevated rail is visible, people don't like change, change which is visible is easily protested against. I was actually inspired to make this video by the Stadtbahn in Berlin. The Stadtbahn is an elevated rail line right through central Berlin that carries both the S-Bahn and regional and intercity trains through the center of the city, past some of the most iconic and historic locations. It was built over 150 years ago. From the Hauptbahnhof to Alexanderplatz, the Stadtbahn lets hundreds of thousands of people glide effortlessly through the center of Berlin every single day. And what's really stuck with me is that when I rode into this city on the train from the airport and I passed buildings that were densely packed around the stop on, so often that I could often see into people's apartments where they were working at their desks, they rarely even turned up to look at the train that was passing by. Quite the opposite, Berlin would be way worse without the stop on. There would be more traffic and less zero emissions public transit. The city would also have less iconic public spaces, and the city wouldn't have any of the amazing restaurants and stores located under the elevated rail. And I have to say, as much as I love underground rail, including the other cross-city S-Bahn in Berlin, there's something so much more pleasant about being above the ground and being able to see the sky and have fresh air and birds chirping as you wait for your train in the old historic structures of the Stadtbahn. Of course, it's worth noting that elevated trains aren't actually all that different from those at ground level. So often when ground level rail lines need to cross through a city, they're on embankments or they're elevated above roads and they end up being elevated anyways. At the same time, in most urban environments, rail lines are surrounded by development, vegetation, and other things, which mean that you often don't see or hear them unless you actually want to use them. But we shouldn't have to pretend that public transit needs to be hidden away. Because elevated rail is great in so many different ways. Particularly along roadways, elevated rail is a fantastic way of reminding everyone, including those who aren't even driving, that they could be getting to their destination faster and for less money if they got on the train. In Tokyo, you even get reminded that you could head to any of Japan's other great places if you hopped on one of the elevated high-speed Shinkansen trains that weave their way through the city. 
I'll also just say as a public transit rider who's clocked hundreds of thousands of kilometers on trains all over the world, being below ground is always going to be worse than being above ground, where you can see out the windows as the city passes by. And being elevated above the ground is even better because you get a view of the city that you can't really replicate any other way. In any of the cities I've mentioned in this video, one of the best ways a visitor can see and understand the city is just to get on one of the elevated trains and ride around. I'd even argued that in my hometown of Vancouver, one of the most incredible experiences you can have is riding the SkyTrain, looking from the ocean to the mountains as you weave along the hills of Metro Vancouver. It's a special experience that wouldn't be possible if the train was buried in the bedrock. Back to Berlin, I'll note that since the Stadtbahn isn't a giant steel structure, it doesn't have the effect of acting like a giant tuning fork, amplifying the sound of every train that flies over it. You truly hear less from an elevated train, possibly carrying a thousand people traveling overhead than one jerk in a loud car. People so often complain or ask questions about trains being loud, but the reality is there's just not that much to make noise compared to cars. For one, on any busy road, car traffic is going to be nearly constant. You're always going to have the drum of cars rolling by. But train corridors, even frequent ones, have much less time where trains are actually passing you. At the same time, trains just have less to make noise. While a car has its rubber tires and its big engine, a train has steel wheels which minimize friction and noise, as well as electric motors that quietly hum along. It's also worth pointing out that modern elevated rail systems, which aren't prone to being nearly as rickety or vibration-laden as those of old, are totally quiet and often unnoticeable. A modern elevated rail guideway is also so nimble, narrow, and sleek that any comparison to elevated highways is a huge red flag for me that someone doesn't know what they're talking about. I used to live right next to a modern elevated rail viaduct. I even had trains running through the background of my videos. There was no issue. Meanwhile, today, if my neighbor's dog literally just barks, I have to stop recording and restart. They're not a big deal. Complaining about elevated rail is like complaining that air doesn't have taste or that the sun makes things hot. It's ridiculous. Viaducts are also like anything. Much like you could have an attractive tram system or a less attractive tram system, you can have attractive and rather unattractive viaducts. A city with a penchant for good design is going to have attractive subways and attractive elevated rail, and elevated rail has an ability to add a sort of dimensionality and layers to a city that nothing else really can. And I personally find it really hard to understand why someone in a city choked with traffic or filled with giant roads would find an elevated rail viaduct any more unattractive. At least the elevated train gets you where you need to go quickly with zero emissions and on the cheap. Better yet, the things you can tuck away underneath elevated rail are frankly limitless. In Japan, there's tiny homes. In cities in Europe, you'll so often see restaurants. And in cities around the world, you'll see greenways and walkways under elevated rail, which not only provide shelter from the elements, but also let people walk, run, and roll quickly just as the trains above do. In fact, you can even create public spaces where people might be okay just resting for a moment under elevated rail, like with the SkyRail in Melbourne. Naturally, by putting the trains above the ground, you also create a very adaptable system. You can add stations after the fact, pull up cranes and trucks to do easy maintenance, or even add new track work and connections, like with the red-purple bypass in Chicago, all while keeping trains easily running. It's also a lot easier to expand and improve an elevated station. Adding escalators, elevators, and new entrances just means building off of that existing building, as opposed to digging new holes in the ground. If transit-oriented development is your thing, cities like Bangkok, Delhi, and Tokyo show how you can use skybridges to directly link destinations with the train stations people use, creating development that isn't just transit-oriented, but tied in directly with the transit. It's also probably worth mentioning that in low-lying cities like Bangkok, or Vancouver, or Amsterdam, having rail that's elevated above ground can provide some flood protection. Now, on my channel, I talk a lot about the construction cost crisis in so much of the world, and how long it takes to get big infrastructure built. And this has got to be one of the biggest strengths of elevated rail. Not only is it super functional, easy to maintain, and easy to upgrade and expand, but it's also quick and inexpensive to build. If you've ever lived in a place where they were building a modern elevated rail line, be it a metro in a city or a high-speed rail line through the countryside, you'll know that a modern viaduct can be built with assembly line efficiency. And since two train tracks are narrow and the pillars needed to support an elevated guideway with two tracks are even more narrow, 
You can also fit high capacity elevated rail lines almost anywhere, from the middle of the street to across existing railways and roadways. Even along an existing single track industrial rail siding, you have enough room to put in pillars that can carry a double track high capacity electric railway. And the stations are cheaper and faster to build as well. Since you don't have to go underground, there's a lot more standardization possible. Essentially, you're just building a building around the elevated rail viaduct. This is why you see so much elevated rail in places like China and India. It's faster and less expensive to catch up and create a big metro system really quickly. There's almost never a more efficient way in a dense urban environment than going above. For cities in North America, which are sprawled, filled with large roads and highways and parking lots, elevated rail is so obviously the answer. The reason Vancouver is able to have such a modern, large metro system, one that trades blows with the largest cities on the continent, is because it went above ground and used existing right-of-ways to create a large system. And that thinking has spread to other cities like Honolulu, Seattle, and San Diego, which have started to realize the same things. And I think other cities will as well. When you're growing fast, have tons of car infrastructure, and little money to spend on public transit, going above ground is an obvious choice. And unlike the light rail systems that were so often built over the last several decades, when you go above the streets, you can go much faster than traffic on those streets. It's a big reason why I think the SkyTrain in Vancouver blows the Portland light rail system out of the water in terms of the number of people that actually use it, even when Portland's system is larger. It's just so much faster. Ultimately, while this video won't stop these select urbanists who like to complain that elevated rail is unnatural, imposing, or even anti-urban, what I hope it does do is highlight to you why it's such a great technology. Our cities aren't necessarily natural things. Their greatness comes from what they enable, affordability, bringing people together, and great ideas. And elevated rail is fantastic infrastructure for that. Now, you've seen a lot of elevated rail from Australia in this video, with Melbourne's beautiful SkyRail being one of my favorite urban transit transformation projects in the world. Stay tuned for a video on that. But what you might have missed is a video I did on all of Australia's funky rail gauges last year and how the weird standards came to be, which you can watch exclusively on Nebula right now. Nebula is the streaming platform owned by me and my creator friends, featuring over 14,000 titles that you can watch ad-free, including exclusive and early access videos from urbanist creators like myself, City Nerd, City Beautiful, Life Where I'm From, and Not Just Bikes. We also now have a news division and a film studio, where some of the very best content creators are making excellent large-scale projects you won't be able to find anywhere else, such as The Getaway, a really exciting Nebula original series from the creators of Jet Like the Game, where six different content creators go on a road trip full of exciting games and competitions. Watching my channel on Nebula is one of the best ways you can support my channel and my content as a whole, and as of now, lifetime memberships are back indefinitely for only $300, so you can pay once and get Nebula for as long as both you and Nebula exists, and so Nebula can fund bigger projects in the near future. And if lifetime memberships are not your cup of tea, you can still support me for only $36 a year or $3 a month with our annual plans. We're also now offering annual gift cards so you can share my Nebula exclusive videos with your friends and family too. So go check out Nebula at go.nebula.tv slash rmtransit right now.